What's going on, guys? Welcome to Simple Prepper. Uh, we're doing live and we're doing prepper school. And I say we, me, and Sarah Mack. Robbie um, was supposed to be here, but he didn't make it today. So uh, we've got a lot of cool things to talk about. Uh, one of the things that this came about was I have a buddy of mine that's on our Patreon, and he's a truck driver, long haul truck driver. And he's been asking about being out of town. And what are the things that he needs to get himself home? Uh, and then I have another buddy of mine who was just talking about it the other night. He's going to uh, Minneapolis and he said, I'm going to be a long way from home. What, how do I get home? What do I need to carry? And so we're in guys vacation seasons here. So a lot of us are out of town. We're getting ready to go on vacation in the next uh, just a little while. And um, we're going to be gone. And so planning how to get home and having the right gear to get you home in a long distance environment, um, especially one that is gonna progressively be more dangerous as time goes on. Uh, and so we're, we're gonna look at it. I'll probably do a standard video, kind of going through a little more of the details, uh, but the live, we've got a lot, and we since we have a good time amount, we've got a lot to cover. So uh, we really appreciate Sarah Mack for being over at the computer. She will be taking some questions. Uh, we'll take a break in a little bit and um, we'll, you know, you can go ahead and start asking questions if you want. Uh, and she'll just go ahead and have them prepared. So when we take that break, we're ready. Um, we really appreciate Exotac for sponsoring today's episode. And they give you a 20% off using Such20 with the link down below in the description and guys, it's those fire starters are made in Winder, Georgia. They are excellent. They are machined very well. Uh, in fact, I've got my fire kit right here. And uh, the fire rod is just one of the best ferro rods out there. It has a refill in it. Uh, you know, I mean, they just have a lot. They're nano strikers. They're uh, match lights, match caps. So, you know, they really have a, a good array of things. Uh, and we really appreciate those guys. Okay, so again you're uh, on vacation or your business and, you know, you're looking to um, put together something for business. Um, and Robbie is here now. So we're going to kick his butt for being this late, <laughs> but he'll be here in a second. So we're going to move on and shift sh sh things around a little bit. Robbie, I'm going to kick your butt. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right. Hey, we're starting over. How about that? Get over here and sit down. Sorry, right, then. And be quiet. Good gosh. I can't be quiet. I oh, know. That's all right. I don't expect it. Okay. So, guys, again, like I was saying, this is Robbie Week. Hey, guys. Uh, we're glad to have Robbie with us. He's running a little late. And um, so, Robbie has a Wheaton Arms, and he also has the Robbie Wheaton YouTube channel. Uh, the Wheaton Arms, they do all the Glock, well, they do Glock aftermarket parts, yep. but they also do all of the upgrades for the PSA Dagger. So um, the triggers are phenomenal and their barrel systems are great. And so check it out, Wheaton Arms. And I've uh, been a gunsmith for over 20 years. Yes, sir. And he knows how to get home. <laughs> former Marine or, or Marine. I say former people go, you're always a Marine. So it's just Boy Scouts for big kids. That's right. <laughs> All right. Now we're, now we're ready. Now All we're cooking right. with peanut oil. Yes, sir. Um, okay, guys. So um, again, it's, vacation season's here, you know, it's time to kind of look at things. How do you get home? Now mm. for us, we're going to be on the coast of South Carolina. And so relatively it's fairly close, but it's going by three to four miles per hour walking. And, and I'll tell you guys, you can take your phone. I just put my phone down. Uh, you can bring up Google maps and you can look at the distance. So let's say you're planning a trip. And so first thing you want to do is to see how many miles it is. Now, it will, in a, when it's a, a certain distance, it'll give you the actual walking distance it takes. It'll also give you a bicycle difference or distance, how long it'll take you. That's right. So <clears throat> for us, we're going to be down at Myrtle Beach. And so I looked, at the, I looked it all up. It's going to take us three days and 16 hours to walk from the coast to our house. Mm-hmm. Three hour, three days and 16 hours. If I'm riding a bicycle, it's one day <clears throat> and 12 hours. So it cuts it almost into a third. Now, when you say three days and 16 hours, that's walking. 20, that's not that's stopping. Three, nonstop. 24 yeah. hours a day walking to be able to get there. 
when you walk at, you know, say an average of eight to 10 hours a day, now you're looking at a week or more to be able to get home. That's right. That's exactly right. Uh, yes, that does not include sleeping. It doesn't include eating and taking breaks, which you will take breaks. Mm -hmm. uh, if you change those socks. That's right. That's, <laughs> that's exactly right. Especially this time of year. And, you know, we're, the thing is, guys, is it's going to take some time. And that's relatively, we're in the same state. Uh, I looked it up. We're going to Detroit for a wedding coming up. And, you know, it's it's twice as long, twice as long. So, you know, it's figuring that out and being able to get an idea of what you're doing. Um, yes, sleeping, taking breaks, maybe having to go around a long way. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things you're going to want to do is to avoid uh, highly populated areas. And one, you know, especially later on, I think in the beginning, it's not going to, people are going to be kind of stunned. And really, this is the worst case scenario to me for this to happen is an EMP. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you have an EMP, there are some other things that could possibly happen. But to me, an EMP would definitely put you stranded somewhere um, and having to get home. You know, for me, one of the one of the scariest situations with having to get home after some sort of like an EMP attack, for instance, one of the scariest places to be trying to get home is caught on a bridge. Oh, yeah. Because there's, you're stuck there. You know, the, you have to get across the bridge to get across the waterway or whatever that's below you. So you have to cross that bridge or, or like you were talking about going miles and miles and miles out of your way to get around that, that body of water, unless you can find some sort of boat that you can paddle across, but crossing that bridge, because one, you don't know what's on the other side Two, you don't know what's in the middle. It's a very easy place that, you know, you could, somebody could create a fatal funnel and, and you're just stuck there. Right. And right. there's, you know, there's no way to escape, you know, one way or the other. So bridges are one of those areas that, that I really worry about because it's easy to get trapped uh, in a very confined area on a bridge. Well, if, if there was a bridge close to me that I was concerned about, mm -hmm. that would be one of my first places to blockade. Yeah. So, you know, bridges are definitely, like Robbie said, they're a fatal funnel. Um, and especially the longer you go, uh, you know, first day or two, people are milling around. They don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And then panic sets in. Yep. Once panic sets in, things are going to be a little crazy. You see it in Ukraine right now with uh, there's a, a large bridge from Russia into Ukraine. And that bridge has been it's been bombed. It's been blockaded uh, to prevent the flow of troops and supplies across that bridge from Russia over into Ukraine. Right. Right. And so without any kind of water way to travel in water yep. or swim. That's right. Uh, and so and two, one of the things about traveling is you have a fairly large backpack. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's going to add extra weight. That's right. Which really negates swimming. You know, you're not going to you're not going to float a big heavy pack unless you've got a boat or tube or raft or something to put it in some sort of flotation device. You're not going to float that big heavy pack. You're not going to have uh, waterproof compartments inside that pack that's going to keep everything inside there dry. So even if you did try and float it, you're going to get your stuff wet. Right. Right. And, and, you know, and you can get one of those large wet sacks mm -hmm. that are really like rubberized and you can seal that up that actually form as a backpack. But, you know, that there there's limitations to that. Right. So. Um, you know, there you are, you know, there are things that can happen. And again, you want to avoid highly populated areas. Again, bridges are definitely a place of a chokehold. Mm -hmm. And two, you know, highways are going to be the best bet in a sense, because one thing that you definitely need is a map. And guys, I've been talking about maps for years and you need to have maps. We depend on GPS. I mean, it's like we're depending on calculators and we forget math. So, You've got to be able to have a map and be able to interpret it. That's right. Uh, and, you know, you can get different maps for those areas. So plan out your route, see how many miles you have, and then get you a map. And you can actually map it out or at least have this to where you can see. Because the problem is, let's say you go into one town and there's a lot going on. I mean, people are freaking out. Right. People are, you know, and you need to avoid that. You don't want to get lost and get out of your way if you can't get back to it. Also, a good compass. And you're exactly right. And one of the big things with a map, all of your maps have a little compass key in the bottom that show you north, south, east, and west relative to the directions on the map. One of the big things when you're using your compass is to orient your map in the direction of the compass. So oh, that way right. when, you're, when you're looking at the map and it's pointing north, you're facing north. 
and you know that that's the direction that you need to be traveling based off of your roads and stuff that you're looking at on your map. Always keep the map oriented to the direction that you're traveling based off of your compass, and that'll help you stay pointed in the right direction. Right. That's a good point. And two, unfortunately, there's a lot of construction a lot of times, mm -hmm. and so things change. <clears throat> So when you have a GPS, it kind of updates. When you have a map, you need to make sure you have current maps. An old map may not get you to where you're going. Uh, and one or it place, may get you there, but not the most expedient route. Right, right. And you can figure it out, but yep. this is, can be a little tough. That's and, right. And time is of the essence. Now, let me say this about the three to four miles per hour walking. Uh, you know, is that one thing is you have a determination. I mean, for me, I'm going to be jogging if possible. If I was by myself. And here's another consideration. Three to four miles per hour walking. You know, if I went outside right now and just took off three to four miles per hour is no problem whatsoever. Right? And I'm, I'm a tall guy, big guy, got long legs. Three to four miles per hour is super easy. When you put 40 or 50 pounds on your back, three to four miles per hour suddenly becomes much more difficult <laughs> than, than three to four miles per hour with nothing on. When you add all that weight on your back, it's going to slow you down. It's going to tire you out quicker. You're going to burn more calories. You're going to burn more energy. And you're going to have to make sure that you keep up with your food. Make sure you keep up with your water uh, because you're going to be using more of that, carrying the extra weight on your back. That's right. And so, you know, and really in the rule of threes, food is three weeks without food. Mm -hmm. But the big problem is, is you lose energy. That's right. Fatigue. And, and you get tired and you need to keep up some calories to be able to keep going. But determination is a big part of it mm -hmm. because you're going to be focused to get home. Uh, you know, like for us at the beach, we'll have the family together. You know, we'll be traveling together, uh, you know, and there are some bonuses to that because I can travel a little more openly with a larger group. Right. Uh, if you're by yourself, you know, you're going to have to be a little more cautious, a little more careful, but you're going to move faster. The downside to traveling in a larger group is just like military movements in larger groups. You have to have more supplies. All right. A lot more supplies to be able to provide for everyone that's in your group. You have smaller people, younger people. They're not going to be able to carry as much. That means the adults are going to have to be carrying more for the smaller people, the younger people, the elderly in your group. That's putting more of a load on everyone else, which is going to slow you down more. That's right. That's a great point. OK, so one of the things, though, that um, that I want to talk about first off, as far as what you need is. Well, and let me get to this because I was getting ahead of myself a little bit. Um, you need to think about traveling at night as much as you can. Now that's going to cause some issues because, you know, if in an EMP, it's going to be black. I yep. mean, you'll, you'll have some moonlight and skylight, but it's going to be pretty dark. And so, but traveling at night is going to be your better bet. Uh, keeps you more concealed. And we're going to talk about traveling at night in a minute, but. Well, and uh, especially in the summertime, like right now, you know, there we're experiencing tremendous heat waves across the country. Uh, you know, there, there's places in the Midwest and out West that are 110, 115, 120 degrees. Here in the South, we're not seeing temperatures that high, but we're seeing 90 plus with really high humidity. And being able to travel at night, generally the humidity is lower, the temperature is lower, and you're not you're not uh, sweating as much. So you're not you're not your water is not leaving your body as quickly. So you're able to travel longer on less at night than you are during the daytime. Right. Especially if you're able to get on roads and walk on roads without having to, you know, bust brush and stuff. Yeah. And you're exerting yourself more too, which causes yep. more perspiration. Right. Okay. So first off is you need to look at a good bag and, you know, guys, a lot of times, and, and really the bag that I keep in my car as my get home bag, it's really, if I'm, you know, five or 10 miles <laughs> out and something happens or I'm in town or I'm even in the next town, I can get myself home you know, within a few hours, mm -hmm. not a big deal. I've got enough to be able to get me at least through a day or two. Uh, but when it comes to serious get home from a distance, it'd be the same as a bug out bag. Yep. Uh, you've got to have the, the supplies and necessities to sustain you for however many days. Again, th you know, three days and 16 hours walking 24 seven, like Robbie said, is, you know, that still puts you out at least a week. And that's if nothing happens yeah. in between. I mean, that's that's not about 90 hours. So that's that's nine days at 10 hours a day. Right. OK, so with a bag. Now, this is just a mystery ranch. It's a good, solid, larger bag, which mm -hmm. you're going to need. But the real big thing you need is something that has a lot of support in the back. Uh, this even has some side panels here to give you support on your sides. You know, having a good waist strap 
really having a thicker lumbar type system is going to be the best. A lot of heavy padding in the back, really solid shoulder straps. And this has like the yoke system. And so this is something that, you know, is going to be excellent for that. So looking for that right pack. Now, here's the thing. We go to the beach. There's actually, there's going to be 20 of us, mm -hmm. but I'm concerned about my, <laughs> my five. Uh, well, six considering my, my uh, son's girlfriend. So we've got to think about that. Do we have six packs mm -hmm. that are like this? Right. And I'd say no. <laughs> so, well, and you know, not only that, but packing six get home bags as well as your luggage in the vehicle. Right. Yeah. Space, space becomes a concern really quickly when you're traveling in larger groups because you have so much more stuff that you're packing and taking with you. Right. And that has to be a consideration. Well, you know, whenever we go on vacation, I always carry my, I, I carry supplies. I carry my contingency. My, my wife knows about it. I put, put it out there. You know, I've got all my stuff, but it does even that yeah. with just one person. Uh, now, so we have our bag. You've got to pick out something though, that can really give you some support. And that's really the big thing. And unfortunately, these are not cheap. Now there are some lesser expensive options, but just thinking about it, get home bag. I'm, in Oregon and I've got to come back home and my family's here and I will, that will be my focus mm -hmm. is to get home. There's, there's no other alternative. I can't just go, Oh, well, you know, yeah. here I am, I'm going to get home. And so, you know, that really, you know, going with a group is probably something that's really a subject for another day. Yeah. Uh, this is mainly for people that you find yourselves traveling uh, but definitely vacation. We all take vacations typically, and we're, we're, we take them away from home. And so that is something to consider. So first off is to get a really good solid pack. Uh, now, next is what do you put in your pack? Now, let me just say this. First thing, and Robbie will tell you this, is you want as little weight That's right. as possible. Ounces or pounds when it comes to walking. That's right. Ounces yeah, become quit. pounds. And, you know, uh, that. so you you really have to be careful what you're going to put in your pack. You know, here's the thing, guys. We talk about bug out bags all the time. People, oh, bug out bag. I got my bag. And you just put stuff in it. And I remember seeing people on video going, well, I've got this for a little morale booster. And I got this if I need something, you know. And then they're just, before long, they've got everything under the sun in this pack. When the Oregon Trail back in the 1800s, when people were going across to Oregon uh, in, in wagons, stuff was thrown all outside. Mm -hmm. They just threw stuff away. So let me just say this. You know why? Because they realized quickly what they didn't need for survival. Exactly. They, yep. they realized. And the things they needed, they should have put that in there to get mm -hmm. them through. Yep. But the, the problem, the thing is, is with a pack, if you pack it out, guys, some of this stuff you can throw out. Yeah. So you don't have to be super weirded out about it, but the things that you can't throw out, you need to make sure that they're definitely something that has some, you know, that's very lightweight, compact, easy to pack. And so that is the one of the first considerations. And has value. Something that you can't, when I'm packing a get home bag, it's things that I can't live without. Right. Those are the first things that go in that bag. Yeah. What's going to give you survival? Yep. Not these little chocolate wafers that you were really wanting to make you feel good, which, you know, they'll melt anyway. But, you know, the thing is, is having you've got when we're going through this and these are just samples. These are I'm not these are not necessarily the ultimate recommendations. In fact, a lot of this stuff is what I had in here to be able to show you. But in some of my other packs, I have different things. So researching and figuring out different things. OK, so first off, the rule of threes, that is how I base all of my packs. And honestly, I base all my preps. I get down to the, what does it take for me to live? And so first off, uh, it's three minutes without air. So I've got to, if, if that could be a concern, if you're in a forest fire area or if you're in some kind of, uh, you know, of course, if it's biological warfare, that's a whole nother subject. Volcano. Volcanoes, different <clears throat> natural disasters mm -hmm. where, you know, even buildings collapse, that's right. you know, where there's a lot of debris. Uh, you know, air is one thing. Uh, the really, and only actually, the only thing I have is I have a bandana I can put around my face to get through certain areas. But that's really kind of the first things. Plus, there's a bazillion uses for bandanas. Okay, so then it comes to um, three hours in extreme conditions. Typically, we talk about winter, mm -hmm. but right now in the summer, we have to talk about the heat. That's right. And you've got to consider, you know, three hours in harsh conditions. And then it's three days without water. You can live three days without water. 
And guys, these are all just generic. Obviously, you could probably live a little bit longer, but your body starts to break down. Or a little bit less, depending on, you know, conditions and everything. Well, you know, we can go to the range in a hot summer day. Yeah. And within just a few hours, I start cramping up mm -hmm. because of dehydration. That's right. So, you know, if your body's all cramped up, you're not any good. Okay, so three days without water, three weeks without food. But again, like we said, you're going to need to sustain your energy. So while you can live, for you to be effective, you've got to have food. And then it comes medical and then self-defense flow in between. Mm -hmm. Just kind of flow. It could happen at any time. And so let's start out with the first thing. So water is your primary. Um, I mean, first aid is definitely something that, well, we'll just go ahead and start with first aid. First aid, vital. Uh, having a good trauma kit. Having some, um, you know, your, your uh, tourniquet, your hemostatic agents, your chest seals, different things like that, just in case it's trauma. But also Band-Aids, antibiotic ointment. You know, you can cut your finger and it turn into a nasty yep. infection. And then, you know, then you're in big trouble. Uh, Imodium, Tylenol. See, one of the biggest things in my first aid kit for my get home bag is blister care. Yeah, yeah. That's you... If you're walking a lot and you're not used to walking, you're going to get blisters and you have to have a way to be able to treat the blister, protect the blister and be able to keep moving. Right. So I have things in my bag just for blisters to be able to treat and be able to keep moving with blisters. And Moleskin is one that's really good. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and it's really inexpensive. It's lightweight. It's easy to carry. Uh, so definitely one of those big things. But OK, so. First aid. It's no brainer. You know, we need first aid. Uh, and you may be helping someone else on top of that. Mm -hmm. uh, next is water. Uh, water is vital. Uh, you know, having a good container and having it filled with water. Yep. But this isn't going to last you long. No, no. So having a filter. Water weighs eight pounds per gallon and you have to have about a gallon per day. So if we have a week, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that's seven gallons each. Well, we can't do that. So instead, we have water filters. And there's a lot of really nice water fil filter systems out there. And if I was camping and hiking and I had my truck right there, my Jeep, you know, I could get in and get my Katadyne Pro or get some of those or Hyper Pro. Uh, the Sawyer Mini is a real popular uh, item. It's really lightweight. It's very versatile. Uh, and you have this small little bag. And these are great. Uh, one that I personally really like is the Aquamira Frontier Straw. And uh, the straw is over there somewhere. But there's a. this is a very simple system. I think it'll filter about 22 gallons of water. It has different adapters where I can hook it up even to a bladder if I have a water bladder in here. So it gives me a very small option, but it protects me if I'm drinking. Listen, you do not want to get into a creek and start no. drinking. It doesn't matter how clear it looks, how clean it looks. You never know what's upstream. You really don't. I had a buddy of mine that was in this beautiful mountain river going up the mountain. And somebody had actually asked about drinking some water out of it. And he said, ah, you need to treat it. And so they did. They went up about two miles farther and it was a dead cow mm -hmm. in the in the river. Yep. So, you know, you may think and it may be clean coming out of a natural spring, but you still don't know what's up there. Uh, also, just... Uh, just portable water filter or, or water, whatever. This water tabs. Is. Thank you. Water tabs. Yep. Purification, uh, tabs. purification tabs. That's what I was looking yep. for. Uh, I'm glad you made it, Robbie. No. I'd have been standing here for 10 minutes. <laughs> um, but purification tabs. Uh, and this is something, it doesn't take out the sediment. It doesn't take out the taste, but mm -hmm. it will keep you healthy. Yep. And one of the things about water is that if you get sick. Yeah, you're, you're done. It's you're no done. good. No. You may die. Yep. But even if you do, you're sick on the trail. That's going to add a couple of days. So you want to make sure that you have your water taken care of. But as we talked about before, having a container is really important. Now, this container, and this is what I like when I have a container, is it's all metal. So I can actually put this on a fire. If I poured some rice in here or my mountain house or whatever, I could actually cook this right over the fire. Uh, if it has a plastic rim, then you can't because it'll melt. And so this just that's just one of the things that I like to do. Uh, and and you can use a canteen cup, military canteen cups. Those are great. There's a lot of different things that you can use, but mainly just to give you some ideas of what you need to kind of focus on. And then you make your choices. So water, 
big, big deal. Uh, and then next, of course, is food. Now, one of the things that I typically keep in my get-home bag is just some lipo food. Mm -hmm. It's uh, 2,000 calories. It's really small and lightweight. It has a five-year shelf life. It tastes like graham crackers. Yeah. One, when I did my first review on these, I did a review and I opened them up. I tasted them. Before the night was over, I'd eaten the whole freaking <laughs> bar. <laughs> Oh my gosh. And, because it was really good. And I just kept eating it, you know, uh, but it is, it's kind of like a graham cracker, but then it doesn't, it keeps you from getting thirsty mm -hmm. because it's made that way. So this is an excellent option, but you're talking about a week and you know, you, you don't want to eat full diet on that. And plus these are not super light like some of the others, uh, you know, having things like these are just some pro meals. They're just granola type bars with a lot of protein, you know, stuff like that. But, um, MREs are great, and MREs typically have that little uh, cook. You can cook right there in that little bag, which makes it nice. And then, you know, there's all the dehydrated type foods that are camping foods. These are super lightweight. They're easy to carry. And um, so food, but the thing is with this is you've got to boil your water. Right. And then you've got to cook it. A lot more involved. Now, That's, that is one of the nice things about the MREs. You can eat it hot. You can eat it cold. You know, you open the pack, you tear it open. Now, one thing that I do with my MREs in my get home bag, yeah, they, the MRE, it comes in that, that big plastic bag. It's really bulky and there's a lot of wasted space there. I open those up and take all of the food out of it and then pack all of the food into my pack. Right. Separately from the MRE pack because it, it allows you to conserve a lot more space. Right. And you can put those in a little dry sack. I love dry sacks. I didn't really get into how to pack. I mainly got into, but the dry sacks, you can take them and roll them up and you can really keep things in mm -hmm. there, different stuff. But having a small little stove, uh, well, this is not a stove, a little pot <laughs> to be able to cook in. Uh, and then, you know, here's a little small cup, canteen cup to drink out of. Uh, maybe, maybe not. You could probably drink out of your container, but this is titanium. It weighs nothing, but it does take up space. Uh, in these little places, you can actually put things in there and mm -hmm. pack them away. Uh, but one thing, though, that, you know, you can cook over a fire, but the problem is, is will you be able to make a fire right. because of you're making <clears throat> yourself visible? Correct. You, or do you, the, the big thing is, do you want to have a fire that's going to draw attention to you? People see fire, people see smoke, people see light they're drawn to it like moths in a, in a bad situation. Right. And a lot of times you don't want people to be drawn to you. You want to be able to stay as invisible as possible, leave as small a footprint as possible. Yeah. And, and they can smell the food. Oh yes. And oh, if, yes. You're, if they're hungry, you know, it's not going to be a good thing. Yep. So being able to carry one of these little small stoves like that, very important. Yeah. You got your little gas canister, you put it on here. It's a very low signature light. Yep. And so you can cook your food and then you can pack it up and you can leave. Uh, and there's a lot of different choices. I believe this is an MSR, uh, but there are a lot of different choices with that. Um, so food is vital. And guys, the containers and all that stuff, uh, I like military mess kits. Mm -hmm. They work great. Uh, and then, too, utensils, which is one thing. You need utensils. <laughs> you don't want to sit there and dig it out because your hands may or may not be clean. But they make some really small little sporks, plastic versions. Uh, I've got about 20 different versions, titanium, spoons, forks. I even have one that has a spatula that works. Uh, so, you know, there are a lot of options, but definitely get yourself, at least have a spoon. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the big things with, with your food, if you're cooking, is once you finish cooking, you finish eating, you have to clean everything. You're going to have to boil water. You're going to have to clean your spoons. You're going to have to clean your pots before you pack everything away. Otherwise, you're going to end up with bacteria and stuff that starts growing on your cooking pots, which is going to make you sick. That's true. Keep your stuff clean. Right. And two, it just has that smell to it. Yep. You know, you're carrying with you. Uh, and one thing about clean, and I'll just go ahead and bring this up. Uh, here's some combat wipes, but they're just wet wipes. Uh, and one of the problems, once you eat, you may have to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And so this also works, but definitely have a little bit of toilet paper. Uh, you know, you can get a, a half roll, mash it down you know, and make it really small. Uh, but these wet wipes are great, not only for that, but to keep yourself clean. That's right. I'm a big fan of those for being able to just clean yourself up on the go and uh, just keep yourself wiped down while, while you're while you're on your walk on the way home. Right. So food, and you have to plan that out. So let's say that I have a week 
I mean, I've got to plan out my calories, 2000 calories a day, lay it out. And, yeah. you know, you don't, I mean, the thing is, is you may not be able to sustain what you need, right. but at least you have something to be able to get you through and weigh out your calories. Look at them. I mean, for this, I'd have to have seven of these to get me through. Mm. And that's if nothing happens. That's if I get straight to it. Um, okay. Next is, and I don't know guys, if we're going to get to questions or not, because we've got so much we want to cover. We don't want to, um, we don't want to miss something. So uh, here we have our fire kit. Fire kits, guys, vital, vital. Fire is the first element that man mastered, and there was good reason. And fire uh, cooks your food, it boils your water, gives you light, it gives you warmth, it puts predators at bay, or it draws them to you. Or it draws them to you, yep. But here's the thing, even, even in the summertime, you can still get hypothermic in the summertime. So a lot of times you need to have a fire for warmth, even in the summer when it's hot outside. Right. Well, you know, and two, this is another thing. If, if it gets down into a grid down situation where people are all around, there's going to be fires all over, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and there's going to be people with light and they're going to, you know, so, you know, there, you have to weigh out your options. And one of the things about bugging out is we get something set in our mind. And I'll, and I'll tell you this, uh, the series going home, that's what it's about. It's about, um, this guy that started out, Carter, and he started out in one place and he had in Tallahassee, Florida, and he had to get to Gainesville. And it took him a couple of weeks to get there. And it's the story about what he had to do. It's an excellent book. Just the first one about building your get home bag. Chris Weatherman does a beautiful job. And then he keeps expanding it once he gets home. So a great book. I really highly recommend that whole series. Uh, so check that out. But and this will, this will kind of give you some ideas because he, he does it as a teaching. So right. he'll say, hey, I've opened up my bag. I pulled this out. I did this. I did that. And so it, it'll help you a lot. OK, so fire kit, vital and redundancy with your fire. Here we've got a big lighter. Great. These things are the most convenient thing on earth. But like we talked about last week, yep. they go out at the worst possible time. You know, the fuel runs out or the, the little wheel corrodes. So I like to have a ferro rod because I've got a lot of strikes. Uh, different, I've got a couple of different type ferro rods. I've got match cap here, which has lifeboat matches, vital. Uh, I love lifeboat matches. You can even get them wet and they'll come back to light. Uh, these are great. And this keeps them in this sealed container. There's a ton of different choices. And then we have some tender tabs or little quick lights. Um, tender is vital. Tender is important. That's right. Yeah, it's, without tender, it's a lot more difficult to start a fire. So yeah. having having that real fine tender makes fire building and fire starting much easier, whether you're using a lighter or you're using the flint and steel. Yes, and uh, and having that tender. Now, for me, I'm a big fan of Vaseline cotton balls. Mm -hmm. It's a great tender, and yep. it's cheap, and it's easy to make. So that is one thing I typically keep. Uh, here are just some more fireproof matches. So I just fireproof matches. So I just put together <laughs> a <laughs> a little fire kit with different ways to start fire. Right. And you followed the the PACE acronym perfectly with with your fire kit. You know, you've got your lighters for your primary. You've got another lighter for an alternate. You've got matches for a contingency. You've got your fire steel for your emergency. Right. So, I mean, you followed pace all the way through with your, with your fire kit here. Right. Thank yeah. you. That was, that's, that's good. And that's a good point yep. because pace is like Robbie said, it's primary. It's like flipping on the light. You know, that's my primary way to get light. And then you got to go to alternative. Well, what's that? You know, how, what am I going to do now? We turn on your generator and you, you know, and then what is contingency? That's where it starts to get dicey. Mm -hmm. And so what do you do? Solar power. We bring out our solar power. We, you know, and then you go to emergency and that's where you're starting a fire. And that's the only way you've yep. got any light or anything else. So pace is a great way also to be able to line up what you're doing. Um, okay. So next we're going to go to uh, shelter and cordage. Shelter's one that's, you know, it, it, there's a lot of variations. There are, there are. And it really depends on, you have to look at the environments that you could potentially be in for what type of shelter you need. You know, here in the, here in the South in the summertime, it rains a lot. So you need something that is waterproof for your shelter at night or during the day to be able to keep rain off of you, keep you dry. You get wet in the summertime, even in the South, you can get hypothermic very easily and very quickly. 
So being able to stay dry is important, especially with your shelter. Right. And so first off, a, a tent, a tent, you know, that's definitely something that they've been using for a long time. Yep. The problem I have with a tent is I feel enclosed in a tent mm. and somebody can come up on me, get the drop on me. So I'm a little bit nervous about tents. Um, but now if I'm going camping, I'm going to use a tent yep. <laughs> now. But the, the alternative, of course, is just a tarp. Mm -hmm. And you've got eyelet, so you can hang this. You need to have cordage, which is also part of this. So having a good amount of paracord, uh, and this is the spool tool. These are great to organize your paracord. But you can take this, you can tie it to trees, Another focus is your tent stakes. Now you can do it with, with wood. You can do stakes with yep. wood and you can put a notch in them and you can tie it down. But I love tent stakes, tent stakes, cordage and a tarp and you're in good shape. That's right. You've got an expedient shelter right, right there. And you know, <clears throat> this is a nice tarp. It, it's, it's fairly lightweight, it's ripstop and all that. One thing I do like though, and I have a number of them. In fact, I was going to show it, but I couldn't find it. Uh, I have a tarp that has mylar inside. Mm -hmm. So it gives you the insulation also, and which can be really vital. Yep. One of the big things that I like to do, especially in the summertime in the South, you know, that that's where we are. So I, I refer to that a lot because it is our environment that, that we live and work in. When you're, when you're outdoors in the summertime here, if you're on the ground, you're going to have insects. So what I like to do, um, I'm guessing this is a, it is, yeah, it is. Yep. Yeah. You've got your hammock. So you pop your hammock up in between two trees and then you take your tarp and you A-frame your tarp over your hammock. So now you have a shelter that's off the ground. You're away from the insects and you've got a tarp over you to keep water and moisture off of you. That's right. That's a, that's and, and tar, um, those are very comfortable to yep. sleep in. You know, if you're sleeping on the ground, <laughs> it's going to get uncomfortable. Yes. But, you know, and you don't want to have to carry a pad and all before long, you, you can't it's carry just more and more stuff. So a nice little small hammock, ultralight hammock. Again, like Robbie said, man, that, you know, putting that A-frame tarp over it, it makes it really simple. Now, let me just say this. You need to get out and try it. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do this when you're 500 miles from home and you got to live yeah. and die by it. Well, you know, one of the one of the big things is how many how many feet apart does does your trees need to be? How big around do your trees need to be? Right. You know, you've got you've got your uh, your attachment system for your for your hammock. But that attachment system only expands out so far and it only contracts so far. So you're either going to be too long or you're going to be too short with a big sag in it, which is uncomfortable. So being able to find out exactly how far apart the trees need to be to where you can walk up to some trees, pace it off and know that you're within a foot or so of where you need to be for the optimum angle that you need for your hammock. Right. And make sure it's strong enough. So in the That's morning, right. you're not laying on the ground. Right. Right. <laughs> okay. That now also along with shelter, you know, we have our, small little space bivvies and these are they're very thin they're mm -hmm. now these are actually a little bit better than space blankets uh, they're a little bit more tough but there's a number of different types and of course you can get that bright orange i kind of tend to like the green yep because i want to stay kind of hidden uh but that's a good way to keep you from going into hyperthermia especially if you get wet and yep. like you say you get into a river or something yeah, and a lot of your little cheap space blankets, they are they're easy to tear. They are they are definitely a one-time use deal. Uh, with something like this, you can get multiple uses out of it before before you wear it out. Right. Now, what, one of your favorites and mine on the end. Yes, it is. <laughs> the Wooby. All right. If if you don't have Woobies, you need to go out today. Stop what you're doing as soon as this is over and go buy you some Woobies. Right. These things are absolutely amazing. We've got them all over our house. We use them for throw blankets. They're in our go bags. They're in our get home bags. These are our go to blankets for almost everything. Yeah. And they're so a would be the original design and intent with this is a poncho liner. So you put your military poncho on and this poncho liner goes on the inside of the poncho to help keep you warm in adverse conditions. But they they work wonders for a blanket summertime, wintertime, a sleeping bag liner to help keep your heat inside the sleeping bag. You can take a sleeping bag that's only rated for like 30 or 40 degrees and drop the temperature down another 20 degrees. Just having a woobie being wrapped up inside of this inside your sleeping bag. Yeah, Tremendous they are, and they're super lightweight, yep. easy to compress. And again, used by the U.S. military. Yep. Tell you what, let's do. Let's because I hate this. I hate not to take some questions. We're going to take some questions and then we're going to go through the rest of the list. If, uh, if you're ready, Sarah Mac, <laughs> sorry. Well, I just thought about it. 
I just didn't want to leave these guys hanging. I know they like to ask questions and they always ask good ones. Uh, Brian Taylor asked, do you believe EMP shields work? Well, I guess it's according to who's doing them, yep. uh, according <clears throat> to what it is. One thing that I, and, and I'll mention this in just a minute, because we do have some flashlights and some things that could be susceptible to an EMP, maybe. Uh, so having a small little EMP bag, and I know that they, they typically work really well, uh, but um, there's a lot of mystery around the EMPs yep. and what the damage can do and how, how extensive and it's your location. So um, how close to the blast you are, it plays a big part in it. Yeah. Um, so there, there's a, there's a lot of maybes with, with EMP protection, you know, Faraday bags and stuff like that, as far as how effective it would be and what distance you need to be away uh, from the blast for it to be more effective or less effective. One thing I like to do is to test it. So I'll put my electronics in there and, and see if I can call my phone, mm. you know, those kind of things just to see if it's getting any kind of waves, but it's, it's a different type wave with the EMP. It's a different, and two with the different weapon systems, because I have a buddy of mine that's an expert in EMPs. And he said that the fact is, is it may protect it against one type blast. It may not protect it against another. Uh, and really what it does is their little mesh grid and it keeps the waves because the waves are actually doing this. So when they hit, they, they can't hit into that, that area because they're deflected by those small little holes. Uh, uh, but one thing is, is to make sure things aren't conductive. You know, if you have a, a container that you have, you want to make sure that, you know, that it, it, it is conductive. You need it actually conductive, but then inside you have insulation to keep it protected. Uh, but that, that's a, a subject for another day, but you know, really I haven't tested them. And to be honest with you, there's a lot of people that are real serious experts that, we haven't actually experienced a true yeah. EMP. And, and, and even then, a lot of it is just theoretical so as far as what will work, what won't work. You know, there, there's a lot of theory behind it that says that it should, they should work and should be very effective. But, you know, until you actually experience something like that, it's really difficult to say or, or simulate that type of blast. It's really difficult to say how effective a particular item will be. But, you know, the U.S. military has used uh, limited EMPs in mm -hmm. certain areas. If you're going into an insurgency strong area, they have used uh, EMP weapons. So, you know, there's just a lot of conjecture. But as far as particular products, I don't know. Uh, unvaccinated asks, question, what's your all-time favorite EDC pocket knife? Thanks. My all-time favorite EDC pocket knife is the Sabenza, I think. Um Chris Reeves, Sabenza. I just love that knife. I'll tell you this though, for years I carried the Benchmade Barrage and I love that knife. And when they did their little sideways, whatever they did, I <laughs> put my, I put them in the safe. I'm not going to carry them. Uh, but, uh, and I really love zero tolerance. Zero tolerance mm -hmm. makes some fantastic knives. So, um, and I have a number of those. I think the Microtechs would probably be tops on oh, my yeah. list. Yeah. Microtech. I, I love Microtech. And, um, and really, what I do is I dress when I dress up. I take my microtechs. Yeah, and you know, or um, so they're super sharp, uh, incredible edge on the knives. They hold an edge really well. They're easy to sharpen. I mean, they they check all the boxes for me. The yeah. microtech stuff is some of the best. Uh, Comey Billings asks, been meaning to ask, where did that fire roll tool roll um, come up from? Is it an Exotech item I missed? Oh, the Exotech fire roll, the little or the Oh, oh, this? No, this is just a little Maxpedition bag. It's just a Maxpedition little mini pouch. And uh, this is one of my first fire kits where I put this together uh, or use this bag. I love these little bags. Uh, I do have an Exotac fire roll, which is from Exotac, and it's made for the tools. It is an excellent uh, pack as well. And uh, I also have a fire roll of the Pioneer tool roll from Roaring Fire Gear with a wax canvas. I love that tool roll. And, um, but you know, really these little packs like this are great, but a tool roll I love cause I can just roll it out and everything's right there. So uh, Exotac does make them and you get 20% off using suit 20 if you want to get one. Um, and I have a, a few of them that I've actually purchased cause I really love them. Uh, David Frost asked question. Can you cover a little bit on what the most important things to have in a child's go bag would be compared to an adult's? P.S. Get Robbie a hall pass. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I let him in. <laughs> um, of course, he might have torn the door off. But um, <laughs> I already have my knife out. 
I did. Be, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Yeah. But, um, you know, the thing is with, with kids is according to age. Yep. And, you know, one of the things that can happen, and guys, I don't care how protective you are. I don't care what. You can be separated from your children. Mm-hmm. So it is important to give them some means, um, you know, whether it's a whistle and just a few things, you know, maybe a snack in their bag, a raincoat. Just And I did a video on kids, kids get home bags or kids bug out bags. Uh, because, you know, when you have a four and five year old, you don't want to put a knife in there. Right. Uh, when you have an eight, nine year old, you can put a knife in there, but, you you know, you don't put a gun in there. So, I mean, you know, there are certain things that kind of lead up to it. Yeah. And then a big thing is also the weight of the pack. You really want to you want to balance the weight for something that's going to be easy for them to carry and not and not overwhelm them uh, and exhaust them in a really short period of time. So you have to be very careful about how much weight or even how big and bulky items are that you put in a kid's backpack because a, a big bulky item, even though it's not very heavy, can change the the balance, the, right? The yeah. center of gravity with the pack, how it fits on their back. So you have to be really careful and conscious of that. So I would definitely put in an emergency space blanket, something like this. Yeah. Because if they get really cold, they can open this up and get in it. A rain jacket. Um, you know, if they're old enough to know how to build a fire, uh, a small knife or some kind of little tool, if, maybe if it's not sharp for a younger one. But uh, yes, it, it takes like extra socks mm-hmm. and clothes, you know, some things just to get them by. Um, and, you know, I look at like the small stuff that, that you're not going to put a ton of extras in your pack, like tent stakes. They're small, they're lightweight, they're easy to carry. Those are great things to put in a kid's backpack because they're not heavy. They're not taking up a lot of weight and space but they're going to eat up a lot of space in your pack if you're carrying them for the whole family. So little things like that, that they can carry a little bit of food that they can carry a small flashlight. You know, it's oh, not yeah, really going to do them a whole lot of good, uh, but it will give them a bit of comfort if they're in a dark situation and need a light. And you might be able to shine it where they right. can find them. Yep. Um, yeah. So there are some things you just have to think about age and what they can deal with. And mm. two, taking them out and teaching them. Okay, we've got to get back to our list. Um, and guys, I apologize because we really like to take your questions. Okay, so we've gone into rain gear. Rain gear, I mean, that's a simple one. We have just a rain jacket over there, something that's breathable, something you put on. Yep. Um, yeah, rain jacket and rain pants. You yeah. know, a lot of times people don't, they don't consider the pants portion of it. But, you know, if, it, if it's raining hard, all that water is running down your rain jacket straight onto your legs. It's really easy for your legs to get cold. Not just that, all that water is running down your pants and into your boots. And now you've got cold, wet, damp feet. That's really easy to get blisters on, which are bad when you're having to walk. So rain pants that cover your legs and cover your boots all the way down to where they're waterproof so you don't get water into your boots, I think, are maybe as important or even more important than a raincoat itself. Right, right. Uh, socks. And that's what we've been kind of talking about. Yep. Just having some good wool socks or something that has synthetic that'll get the, the water off your feet, yep. but having extra pair of socks. And after you wear your socks for a while and you change your socks out, don't take those wet socks and shove them back in your pack. All right. They're going to stay wet. They're going to keep that moisture. They're going to end up getting bacteria and you're going to end up having mold and stuff inside your socks and your backpack. Take your socks and hang them on the outside of your backpack and let them dry on the outside of your backpack. And then once they're dry, then you can pack them back up or swap them back out with the ones that you're wearing. Right, right. Uh, Shoes, walking shoes. Yes. Years ago, I was horrible for grabbing some flip flops and taking off and, Mm -hmm. you know, to the store or whatever I was doing and uh, not having shoes. So I started keeping some boots in my vehicle so I can, you know, if I do find myself that way, I've got some boots. So. Good walking shoes, boots to me are, are an excellent choice. Uh, when they had their big blizzard down in Atlanta a few years ago, it was a sudden blizzard and it, the freeways were locked down. Mm-hmm. And you saw people walking around in business attire with, yeah. with business type shoes and loafers and stuff. And they're walking on the ice, women with high heels walking on the <laughs> ice, no jackets, you know. And uh, so, you know, just make sure you have some good walking shoes at least. Summertime, you know, we got flip flops, we got our our hey dudes, you yeah. know, we're kind of cruising, but make sure do you have something that you know you have put away in your vehicle or whatever you're doing. And spend some time with shoes. You know, go go to a bunch of different stores, try on a lot of different boots, hiking boots. You know, I'm I'm a big fan of not not necessarily really tall boots, but like the 
your hiking and trekking shoes. Right. Uh, I'm a big fan of those just because they're more comfortable and I can walk a long time in those. But try on a bunch of different shoes. Find something that fits you really, really well right out of the box. If there's a little tight spot, what what you call a hot spot on the shoe where it rubs you just a little bit. And you're like, oh, it'll break in. It, it will eventually. But it's going to wear a blister on your foot before that shoe ever breaks in. So be particular with your shoes. Be very particular with them and get something that fits you extremely well right out of the box before you buy it. And break them in. And still and, break them and in. And break them in. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you start, just take them and go to the store, walk around. I have some Keens that are those half boots. Mm -hmm. I love those things. I mean, they have been the best. Um, but, you know, and then two, the you, the uh, those zip up side boots yeah. from um, LA Police Gear, those things are awesome and uh, very comfortable and easy to wear. But just find you a good pair. Again, you can keep them in your pack or in your vehicle. And then if you happen to you know not be prepared, you can switch it out. Now, I tell you, I'll, all right, so I'm going to have to poo-poo for a minute. The, well, you, you need nope, these nope, wipes. No, I'm good. I'm good right here. <laughs> the the Kings, abs, bought, bought my first pair of them, absolutely loved them. Fit extremely well, very comfortable, loved walking around with them. I split the soles on them in less than three months. Oh. And just completely turned me off to those shoes. See, I've had this pair I've got for two years yeah. and they're just great. Yeah. I mean, and I wear the crap out of them. Yeah. So, you know, but, you know, that's something to think about it because is. you're you're a bigger guy. Yep. You know, you're taller. You have more you know pressure on the shoe. Yep. So it's important to find the right one. That's right. And, and they were very comfortable. But, you know, it three months, maybe a little less than three months. And the sole split right at the ball of my foot. Wow. All the way across. You know, and one thing too, guys, we have a, a big resource with feedback and you can mm -hmm. go into certain places and, and, and when I'm buying something, I go into the feedback yes. and I look at the middle. I don't yep. look at the negative or the high. I try to look at the middle and give me a good idea of what's going on. Okay. So we've talked about medical, which is on the list. Now let's talk about lights and lights are one of those things, you know, light is your number one security tool, but it can also give you away mm -hmm. in a really dark situation. Uh, one thing that I think is vital is a headlamp. Yep. If I only had one light, it would be a headlamp because it gives me hands free. And then I can take this one. Now there's a lot of, you know, the, um, uh, the different types that are, that are attacked. They're molded. Clip bones or molded. Yeah. Or, yep. But I like these that come off and then I can use it. And then if I need to, I can put it back on here and these are super comfortable. This is an Olite, um, one of their headlamps, the Perun, uh, they make a larger size. But I also like to have a standard flashlight. And guys, and that's aside from my EDC light. Mm -hmm. I'll have my EDC light in my pocket, hopefully. So this will give me a, a backup because, you know, two is one, one is none. <clears throat> so have you a couple of lights. But again, be careful how you use That's them. right. Uh, you don't want to go shut. Plus, it runs your battery down. That was just going to say, in an emergency situation, if you're having to use a flashlight, you want to run it on whatever the lowest possible setting is that that flashlight has to conserve your battery life as long as possible. Right. And then if you need it, you know, you can just pump it up a little bit. Yep. Uh, now, the big thing about flashlights is, you know, especially these rechargeable batteries is they can, they're going to die after a while. Uh, and so having a you know battery backup and having the cord, mm -hmm. the one thing I love about Olights is that you know I can charge it just like this, putting it in a USB. Uh, so it's really easy. I don't have to take batteries out and get dirt and everything else in there. I can just do this. It keeps it sealed. Um, now, the other side of this is, is in an EMP, it may short this out. It may short your lights out. Right. So a good thing to do is to get a Faraday bag. Uh, you can get them on Amazon. They're they're fairly inexpensive, mm -hmm. and you can put it in there. What I would do though is I would test it by putting my phone in, call it, having somebody call it, and see if it receives a signal. That's about the only test, unless you go into a big scientific, you know, whatever. But at least, and this is one thing my buddy said because I was asking him a lot of questions about EMP, and he said, "Look, he goes honestly, we don't know all the effects it can have." He said, "But the thing is, you do what you can." And then that's all you can do, right? You know, so you take your EMP bag, you take your EMP shield, whatever you're doing, you try to protect it. If it doesn't work, well, you know, I you know that all sounds, you can do. Yeah. And so, but test it as much as you can to see and see what the reviews are. But again, any electronics, I want to put those in a, a little Faraday bag and be, to be able to protect it. Okay. Uh, Good. We're, we're getting down. I was really afraid we we're going to be able to get finished. So good, good, good. Uh, insect repellent. 
<laughs> you know, I mean, mosquitoes can carry you away. And well, ticks. And, and, and not just carry you away, but the diseases that right. they carry are, are much, much worse than the, the temporary discomfort of the itchy rash that you get from a mosquito. Ticks this time of year, you've got Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. You've got uh, uh, Lyme disease and several other diseases that ticks carry. Mosquitoes, you have uh, malaria. You've got typhoid. There's a ton of diseases that mosquitoes carry. And now a lot of that has been eradicated in the United States, but in a grid down situation, it wouldn't take very long for those diseases to become prevalent in the United States again. Well, and two, because of our Southern border, we're having a lot of people coming from South America that are bringing a lot of those diseases that were covered here. So that is definitely a, something to consider. Uh, now, one thing, and I say this for last, this is one thing that can be very expensive uh, at night vision. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the things uh, that, uh, the, in fact, uh, I went to the Night Fighter 101 class for TNVC, and one of the things he said was night vision gives you a superpower. Yep. You're able to see in the dark, and you're able to see warnings or see somebody coming up or see to avoid an area. I mean, there's so many reasons why it would be great to have some kind of night vision. Now, this is a PBS 14. It runs about $3,000. So, you know, for a lot of people, that's above their budget. And these are expensive, but they're, this is what the U.S. military uses. It is. And it's white phosphorus and all that. And one of, the, one of the big things with any of your night vision that you have, whether it's the PBS 14 or this little one-leaf AI night vision, that's a, a clip-on. You can clip it onto a rifle scope or you can use it as a handheld monocular. One of the big things with either of these is replacement batteries. You have to keep replacement batteries. These are great, but the runtime is only about 45 minutes to an hour in optimal conditions. Um, your PVS-14 has a lot better runtime than that, but it still has a life cycle on the batteries. So if you're gonna if you're gonna spend the money on night vision, spend the extra money and keep the spare batteries on hand so your night vision stays in good working order. And, you know, these little compartments that keep the battery sealed, you should have some extra batteries. Uh, and this would be something that I would put in a Faraday bag. Yep. But these little one leafs, I mean, they're they're fairly reasonable. They are. And, and they're not bad. I've taken them out and used them. I know Robbie's done quite a bit. I with have. Them. I have. Yeah, they're, you know, even with the little built-in IR Illuminator that comes on it, 300, 350 yards uh, visual with it that you can, that you can spot and identify. Um, you know, even little small animals like raccoons and possums, you can see them at 300 yards and identify them. Wow. People at 300 yards, super easy to identify. So, so you know, an inexpensive option, but yet yeah, for a $300 option versus a $3,000 option, it, it is a really, really good one. Okay, guys. Well, I think we got through the list. The the, the uh, outline will be in the description below, maybe help you to guide through it instead of having to go back through it. But I think it's going to be important. Oh, one thing I do want to mention, because we didn't talk about self-defense on purpose. We just didn't go into that because there's a lot of people that watch our channel that are mm -hmm. in the UK, they're in right. you know Italy, they're in different <clears throat> places uh, in South America. But having some pepper spray, now, one of the things that's going to be vital if you're in an area where there's possible predators like bear and cougar, things like that, you may want to go more to a bear spray. Uh, but this is something that you can spray someone without the report of a gunshot. Yep. Uh, it's a non-lethal option. And so, you know, it, it just gives you a different option. Uh, so having this now, if you're traveling like by plane and a lot of this stuff, you can't really carry that right. way. But, um, you know, and you have to adapt. And the thing is, if you're traveling by air, you've got to put together the things that you can carry. Maybe, you know, of course, obviously you won't be carrying on, but you can, you know, they'll allow you to carry. And you can look through TSA to see what those things are. Uh, this will be a big no-no because it's an aerosol. But you could also buy something when you get there, right. buy it. And then when you're finished, and you're going to fly, just toss it out. It's just insurance. So that's, that's something. Do you have something to add? Because I know we've got a lot of stuff. You know, I, I think I think we really covered a lot of it. <laughs> you know, the oh the, multi tool. I'm sorry, Rob. No, multi tool, fine. great. Uh, this one has bit drivers, just a little Gerber. Uh, the silky saw, absolutely awesome for cutting limbs and things. Uh, I just happen to see those laying there, and then having a right and a rain pad with a space pen. This is one of the space pens, and um, I just happen to see those, and I thought, oh, I didn't mention that. Uh, and so we're going to be doing, and of course, the ever-present heavy meal trash bag. Always 
they're lightweight, they're easy to pack at the bottom of your pack, and they're just beautiful. Ah, oh, man, what a list. What a list. I'm glad you got here. I am too. <laughs> I am too. Usually he gets here by the skin of his teeth. This time he got by the molars. <laughs> I, got, I got sidetracked. No, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I was just glad you made it. So, guys, again, we're going to probably do a, an in-depth video on this a little bit more and get into a little more detail. Uh, but we just this is something that's been very important. A lot of people have asked, and with vacation season and a lot of you guys traveling for business, this is something that really you need to consider. And again, map it out. See how long it takes you. It'll really be an eye-opener. Yeah, It'll be sure. a real eye-opener. And again, double that. Double that time because that's just the walking. That's not the sleeping and the resting like Robbie talked about. So again, check out Wheaton Arms. Uh, check out Wheaton Arms. Um, well, Wheaton Arms YouTube channel, what it used to be. Now it's Robbie Wheaton yep. on YouTube. Uh, gunsmith for over 20 years. He brings a real unique perspective on his gun channel and um, also makes some of the best Glock aftermarket parts out there. And we really appreciate him being here. Yeah, we've got some really, really good prepping videos that we're working on right now. Oh, good. For good. Uh, kind of something along the lines of this, but it's you guys are going to love it. Absolutely going to go, going to love it. We're going to have a uh, overview video coming up in the next couple of days that just kind of talks about the video series that we're working on. And uh, the first video should be out one day next week. Very good. Awesome. Well, I'll check that out. Might get educated. <laughs> and also Sarah Mack for uh, taking care and monitoring and asking the questions, taking them down again, guys, I apologize for not uh, opening it up more to questions. I just knew we had a lot to cover this time. So we'll catch you next time. And we won't be here next week. Uh, we're going to be out of town. So um, we'll uh, we'll catch you in the, the week after. So be strong. Be of good courage. God bless America. Long live the republic.